Hello everyone, welcome to BM7017 Global Marketing Management Session 1. This session has two main topics. First of all, we'll look at the concept of marketing. What is marketing? Secondly, we will look at global marketing, the challenges and the issues that organisations face when they're conducting their marketing across more than one country. So what is marketing? Well, to be honest, it would be easier to start by thinking about what marketing is not, because marketing is very often misunderstood by people. It's often thought that marketing is just about selling things. It doesn't really matter what we manufacture, what we take to the market. The important thing is to sell it to people. Now, that is a very short sighted view. Of course, sales is an important aspect of the overall marketing process. But it's only one part and it is not the entirety of marketing. You can't sell things to people that they don't want. People aren't stupid. You can't sell things to people that are not fit for purpose, that don't deliver good value, that don't work. So selling has a role to play, but marketing is much, much more than that. Some people think that marketing is just advertising, advertising on television, on billboards, print media, cinema, radio, uh, digital, web advertising, banner displays, social media advertising. Of course, advertising is a very, very important tool and it is a key part of the overall marketing process. But as with selling, it's not the whole of marketing very far from it. There are many other things that need to be done first in the marketing process before you get to the point of advertising your product, your service, your brand. You need to make sure you have the right product. You need to make sure that it's priced and distributed appropriately. You need to make sure that you're targeting the right customers. So advertising is important, but it isn't all of what marketing is about. Similarly, some people think that marketing is just about promoting things, money off, special price offers, buy one, get one free, competitions, prize draws. Again, these are important techniques that can incentivize people to buy things at a particular point in time. They can't make up for the fact of having the wrong product or targeting the wrong people. And so promotion is like selling, like advertising, a tool that is used in marketing, but it isn't marketing all by itself. So let's look now at what marketing is. If it isn't just selling, it isn't just advertising, and it isn't just promotion. This slide shows some of the core concepts in the world of marketing. Now, we're going to start at um, 11 o'clock on this clock face here with needs, wants, and demands, because these are at the heart of marketing. We have marketing because Consumers and organisational buyers need things. Organisations need furniture for their offices. They need IT systems. Um, they need um, catering services, potentially. Gardening, landscaping services for, for their premises. We as consumers need all sorts of things. We need food, we need clothing, we need transportation. We also need things that are, are less fundamental, perhaps. We need entertainment. We need education. Um, we need our self-esteem boosting sometimes by a new bottle of aftershave or perfume or a new lipstick. We need sporting goods to keep us fit and healthy. We need uh, wearable tech to monitor our, our fitness and so on. Now, all of these needs um, organisations can, can meet through the development and the marketing of appropriate products and services. But before we leave our 11 o'clock slot on our clock face, what then is the difference between a need, a want and a demand? They are all subtly different things. A need is the innate requirement. I'm thirsty. I need something to drink. I've got a new job. I need some new clothing. Um, I've taken up tennis. I need a tennis racket. A want is something more specific. Um, I've taken up tennis. I need a new tennis racket. I want a relatively lightweight one because I'm not very strong. Or I want one with a particular shape or configuration or weight ratio in terms of the, the handle to the head. 
I'm thirsty, I need a drink. I want some iced tea. A demand is a need and a want backed up with the economic ability to pay. If people can't pay for things, generally speaking, we operate in financially driven markets where money is exchanged for goods and services. And so if people cannot pay for them, they're not really in the market. I would love to have an Aston Martin car, but I can't afford one. So I'm not really part of that marketplace as far as Aston Martin is concerned. So organisations need to understand our needs and our wants and examine our economic spending power so that they can price things appropriately. And their research and analysis of all of that information will lead them to create products and services that tap in to these needs and wants. Soft drinks, cosmetics, cars, tennis rackets, sporting uh, shoes, running shoes, uh, air conditioning equipment, solar panels, double glazing. Think of all of the different types of products and services that are offered in the world. They all tap into particular needs and wants, either from consumers or organisational buyers. Now, if we design and develop our products and services appropriately, if they work, if they're good, if they're effective, if they're appropriately priced, then they will deliver value, satisfaction and quality to the customers. Customers will get a good deal. They will buy something that delivers, delivers value. It makes them satisfied. They realise they have purchased a quality item or a quality service. They've had a really good haircut from that salon. Uh, they purchased a new camera and they're delighted with it. They think the functionality is fantastic. It was good value for money. Uh, it's easy to use, etc. And so when products and services meet customers' needs in that way, when they do deliver value, satisfaction and quality, people buy them. They exchange their hard earned money, their hard won cash for these goods and services. And Sometimes those um, exchanges are one off. So if you think about buying something like solar panels to put on your house, you're not going to do that very often. That's a one off purchase. Um, and so it can be considered perhaps transactional. But actually, if you think about it, the company that sells you the solar panels also has a possibility of building a long term relationship with you because they're going to have to come back to service and maintain the solar panels. They may be able to provide you with add-on services, support and advice to help you make the most of the investment that you've made in making your home more energy efficient. So sometimes the things that we buy are one-off transactions. Running into a petrol station shop to buy a packet of chewing gum or a bottle of water. But very often organisations develop longer term relationships with their customers. The customers become loyal, repeat buyers coming back to buy again and again, going to the same grocery store, going to the same gym, staying with their bank or their insurance company for a length of time. And those relationships are critically important for organisations because they bring in streams of revenue over time. If an organisation has loyal repeat customers, it has what's known as customer lifetime value. It can count on future revenue from those customers. That's very important. So the aggregation, the net sum total of all of those exchanges of money, all of those uh, individual purchases of packets of tissues, bottles of water, solar panels for a house, new cars, clothes, etc., aggregate together to form markets. So market is a collection of buyers of a particular type of product or service. So we talk about the soft drinks market, the cosmetics market, the solar energy market, the SUV car market, sports utility vehicle a segment of the car market, the small hatchback car market, the life insurance market. And those markets can be measured. We can measure how many customers are and how much revenue is available for organisations to tap into. 
those markets. And it's really important to remember that a market and an industry are not the same thing, and the two terms should not be used interchangeably. A market is a collection of buyers, consumer buyers like you and me, organisational buyers. An industry is a collection of organisations that manufacture something, that make something in a particular sector. And we won't be looking very much at the industry perspective on this module. We are interested in markets, the, the consumers and the organisations who want to buy goods and services. Now, before we go any further, it's important for you to know that marketing does not always get an easy ride in the world. There are lots of people who criticise marketing quite uh, in quite an extreme way. And you need to be aware of that. You've chosen to study marketing. I assume you want to work in marketing. So you need to be ready to understand why people criticise it and ready to defend your chosen career path, but also ready to improve marketing to counter some of these criticisms because some of them do have valid roots. So let's look at the points on this slide. First of all, it has been said uh, quite often that there is a gap between what goes on in the world of marketing theory, what we read about in our textbooks and in our academic journal articles, and what really goes on day to day in organisations in terms of marketing practice. And that can be true. There are many organisations where the people responsible for marketing have never studied marketing. They've never had the opportunity to do a marketing master's like you. They've never, uh, they've never read marketing textbooks. And that doesn't mean to say that what they do is wrong or bad, but they don't necessarily understand why things work or do not work. And so they may have a marketing campaign that works really well. They won't really understand why that has worked well and how to replicate that and adjust it and fine tune it unless they understand marketing theory. Now, the worst examples, there are organisations that practice what really isn't marketing at all. Things that we looked at on the first slide, they think they're doing marketing, but really all they're doing is selling. They have a sales orientation to the marketplace, not a marketing orientation. They're not really interested in customers. They're not really interested in understanding what customers need and what will deliver value. They just want to make what they want to make and sell it. So, yes, there is a gap sometimes between marketing theory and the reality of marketing practice. But hopefully with people like you going out into the marketplace, and getting jobs and working in organisational marketing and knowing and understanding marketing theory, that gap will close. Secondly, some people say that marketing is irresponsible. And marketing doesn't really recognise the responsibility that organisations have to society, to consumers, to the employees of a firm, to resources in general. And again, yes, there are examples of irresponsible marketing out there, which have encouraged consumerism at the expense of perhaps other more important values, um, have encouraged people to buy things perhaps they don't really need, um, that haven't taken due consideration of resources, such as fast fashion, which uses enormous quantities of water, um, advertising perhaps being irresponsible in making exaggerated or possibly even false claims about products. So yes, there are some examples of this kind of bad practice, um, but fortunately there are many, many more examples of excellent practice. Those aren't the ones that get written about in the newspapers and the magazines. It's always the bad practice that people notice, but there is a lot of very strong, solid, socially, ethically responsible marketing going on in organisations all around the world. And later on in this module, we'll look at marketing ethics and look at how we can continue to work to stamp out the bad and promote the good. The third point on this slide is, is a, maybe a little bit of a complicated one. So let's just take a minute to think about this. Some people say that if you actually practice the marketing concept too closely, too strongly, it makes you less 
productive, less competitive and less innovative. How can that be? We've just seen that marketing is about understanding needs, wants and demands, developing products, putting those out in the marketplace, etc. So how, how can that be problematic? Well, if it's too slow. The issue here is not that the marketing concept itself is flawed, but that sometimes organisations take too long to go through each of the stages. And by the time they've done all their research, their analysis, their product development, their prototype testing, their market research, etc., somebody else has completely overtaken them and entered the market with a, um, a similar or a better product. Um, another issue is that um, we, we rely very heavily in marketing on market research, talking to customers, understanding their needs and their wants. But sometimes people don't know what they want. And some innovations, post-it notes, iPhone, Teflon non-stick pans, came about almost by accident or from something completely different. And no amount of market research would necessarily have created or generated those ideas. So the solution here is not to get rid of the marketing concept, not to get rid of marketing research, but to try and speed it up, to be more agile and to get to market more quickly with not necessarily the perfect product, but a good enough product and improve it with customers as time goes on, leading to a fast innovation rate and uh, companies and organisations staying competitive. So the responses to these criticisms then are, first of all, to engage in social marketing. Now, I don't mean social media marketing here. That's something completely different. Social media marketing is using social media, social media influencers to advertise and promote your products. Social marketing is having social and ethical values at the root of your marketing. So being truthful, being honest always thinking about resources, minimising pollution, etc. Another response is to engage fully with marketing ethics and corporate social responsibility so that those are hardwired into an organisation and every marketing activity has ethics and CSR at its root. And then there are more contemporary approaches to marketing, which we will look at in a minute or two, that try to get around these problems of being a bit too slow um, and, and not innovating, not thinking quickly enough, not being agile enough. So where do we start with marketing? Some of you will have come across the concept of the four P's before. The four P's is a very, very simple, widely used classification of the main tools of operational marketing. When you are marketing tangible products like shampoo, tins of beans, cars, toothpaste. The four P's are product, the product itself, place, which stands for the distribution channels through which products are made available to customers, promotion, which covers all of the aspects of the integrated marketing communications mix, such as advertising, public relations, sales promotion and personal selling. And fourthly, price, the all important price that you will charge for your product. Now, there's nothing wrong with thinking about the four P's. Uh, as a starting point for operational marketing. As we'll see as we move on, we sometimes need more than four Ps and sometimes we need to think beyond the four Ps. But this is a very important framework. It's a mental checklist. Yeah? Marketeers need to make sure that they have considered all the aspects of their product or service before they take it to market, that they've covered place, that they've got all of the right distribution channels in place online channels, offline channels, mobile distribution channels, that they've thought about all of the different media that should be used to promote the product and that they've got the price right in relation to what the customer is able to pay and prepared to pay, what competitors are charging. 
Most organisations market bundles of tangible and intangible element. And so increasingly we think about seven P's rather than just four. Let's look at the example of a hotel chain like Hyatt Hotels. So we start uh, bottom right with the product. And that's product in inverted commas because with a hotel, what you're actually delivering to the customer is intangible. It's an experience. It's the experience of staying in a hotel, receiving a bundle of services um, which go to make up that overall experience. But the product in the context of a hotel would encompass things like how many rooms there are, what size the rooms are, um, what kind of amenities and facilities are provided by the hotel, how many restaurants and bars, are there office facilities, is there a swimming pool, is there a gym, is there parking? All of those are aspects of the service product. Moving clockwise around our diagram, we come to people. In a hotel or an airline, many service businesses, the people are the service. They deliver the service. You cannot have a haircut without a hairdresser. You cannot have um, your teeth fixed without a dentist. And so the people bring the service to life. Their personality, the way they're dressed, the way they look, the way they act, the way they interact with customers is critically important. You can think of the people in a service environment as brand ambassadors. They bring the brand to life. They represent the brand. They are the brand in the eyes of the customer. And so getting the right people is critically important. Recruiting people with the right skills, the right personality, the right aptitude to deliver the service. Training them correctly is important remunerating them, giving them the right sort of salary so that they feel incentivized to do their job. Now, these are things that are not normally considered to be aspects of marketing. But in the world of services, marketing and human resource management come very, very closely together. Human resources management people do in terms of recruitment and remuneration and training and incentivization and staff support has a profound effect on how a service is delivered and therefore ultimately has a profound effect on customer satisfaction. If we move around to the next uh, section, we come to process. And this is the service flow. This is the way in which things happen. And there's great scope for innovation here to speed things up. Um, to do things in a way that makes more sense for the customer, that's easier for the customer. So for a hotel, for example, perhaps allowing people to check in online so they don't even have to wait in a queue at a physical check-in desk, allowing them to set up their preferences online before they come to the hotel, um, whether they what sort of pillow they want, whether they want a duvet, um, what facilities they are most likely to use, etc. So there are lots of ways speeding up and simplifying uh, processes. Think about going into a coffee shop and the flow, what you do, you give your order to one person, you move down, you, you pay, you move down again, you collect. That makes the whole process smoother and, and increases the throughput of customers. Moving clockwise round again, we come to physical evidence. These are things that tangibilize the intangible. If we're marketing a service, there's nothing to see. I talk, we talked about hotels. What do you get when you stay in a hotel? An experience. You can't see an experience. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. But organisations can use physical evidence to bring the service to life. So if we think, if we stay with our example of a hotel, physical evidence would be the kinds of toiletries that are used in the hotel room bathroom. Are they luxurious? What kind of image do they portray? Do they support the hotel brand in creating a feeling of luxury? Or are they straightforward? Are they organic? Um, are you provided with a bathrobe? What do, the, what do the sheets on the bed look like? Are they 600 thread count 
uh, beautiful cotton or are they a bit more down to earth? Why does the um, toilet roll in your hotel bathroom often have a fold down to a little peak? Well, that's just to show you, to provide physical evidence that someone has cleaned the bathroom. That's why sometimes you get a little chocolate mint left on your pillow. Physical evidence to show you all of the things that are going on to tangibilise the intangible. Moving round again, our slide we come to price. We've got a whole session on pricing later on in this module, so I won't say too much about it here. But price obviously is critically important. It's the most flexible part of the overall marketing mix. You can't change your hotel and your rooms and your physical evidence very easily and hire and fire people at will. But you can alter your price. And in fact, in things like airlines and hotels and insurance, prices change very frequently. The flexible pricing, which is um, uh, where price decisions are made in real time according to supply and the demand supply of hotel rooms, the demand for hotel rooms. This kind of flexible pricing is very common in services to maximise what's known as yield, the revenue that you, revenue that you get from every hotel room, from every car in your car rental pool, uh, from every table in your restaurant. Then we come round to promotion. And again, you'll be looking at that in a lot more detail on other modules, so I won't say too much about that here. But just to remind you that promotion is part of the marketing mix, but it is not the marketing mix on its own. And finally, place. How do we distribute our products and our services? Uh, now, in the context of a hotel chain, the place element would be where the hotels are located. Um, but also the distribution channels through which rooms in those hotels are sold. So we started out by thinking about Hyatt hotels. Hyatt have their own website and you can go online with Hyatt and book a room. You can also book a room in a Hyatt hotel through um, aggregators or other online channels such as Expedia um, or Booking.com and other channels that are increasingly important that sort of blur the boundary between promotion and distribution would be things like TripAdvisor, where you can read people's reviews of a hotel and then go straight to distribution channels that will allow you to book. So this is our 7B, our extended operational marketing mix. All of the elements of product, service, promotion, people, etc., that come together to bring products and services to the marketplace. So again, let's think about some of the criticisms, some of the problems um, of the four P's and the seven P's approach. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the more contemporary forms of marketing that have been created to address these weaknesses. Now, there's no problem with the four P's and the seven P's, as long as you realise their limitations. Four P's has actually been around since 1960, was first coined by McCarthy, and it has been absolutely the dominant framework in marketing theory um, for, for since, since that time. However, it's just a list. It's not a theory. It's not even a management framework. And as we've seen with the seven P's, the four P's is not even an exhaustive list. Another problem with 4P, 7P is that it's quite technique driven. It's not customer driven. And it can, um, if you don't manage this issue, create silos within organisations. So you get people who just are responsible for product development without thinking about pricing or distribution. You get people who are just responsible for marketing communication or within that just responsible for social media marketing without thinking too much about the product itself or the pricing, etc. So marketing has got to be integrated. People have got to work together. And yes, you have to have techniques. You have to have people who are experts in product development and price analysis and so on. But they have to work with their colleagues, share information, share ideas and come up with integrated marketing campaigns. We don't want each variable, each individual component of the four P's or the seven P's to be considered in isolation. 
we don't certainly don't want operational marketing to become isolated or alienated from the other functional areas in a firm. We've just seen, for example, how in the world of services marketing, that marketing and human resource management need to work together because the people will deliver the service. They will be the brand, be the brand ambassadors. Similarly, we can't make pricing decisions without information from our colleagues in accounting and finance about the cost base of the firm, the costs that need to be covered, etc. Another weakness um, which we can think to overcome of 4P, 7P, is that it can become quite short termist and quite transaction oriented, um, just about individual one off sales. And we've already seen that a lot of buyer behaviour is actually repeat people, loyal customers, regular customers coming back often staying at Hyatt hotels as they move around the world, always buying Ford um, or Opel or BMW cars, um, being loyal to a particular grocery retailer or a particular um, brand of uh, toothpaste or whatever it happens to be. And so we need to think about buyer behaviour as uh, repeat relationship oriented and not just transactional. Another problem with the 4P, 7Ps, which we need to be aware of and overcome, is that it is one way. It's a company doing things to customers. And these days, marketing is two way. It's interactive. Customers often even co-create products and services, co-create brands with organisations. Customer engagement is extremely high in many markets when customers are um, engaging with brands online, uh, blogging about them, becoming social media influencers, becoming very important parts of the overall marketing process. So the old fashioned world of an active organisation and a passive customer doesn't really exist so much anymore. Um, and so we need to build into our understanding of operational marketing, the fact that it is two way. We'll get feedback from customers and that is part of the marketing process. Um, the four P's didn't fit with services and business to business marketing. It was too simplistic and too narrow. And that's why the seven P's needed to be developed, a much more extensive list of variables to consider when you are marketing services or you're in business to business marketing. But both the four P's and the seven P's, where does value fit in? We saw a few slides ago that value is critically important in marketing. Our job as marketeers is to deliver value to customers, better value than they can get from any other organisation in the marketplace so that they will continue to buy our product, our service, continue to support our brand. So although there's no value specific box in our four P's and seven P's, when we use these frameworks, we must always be keeping value at the centre of our mind when we are making our decisions about pricing, products, distribution channels, and so on. Value must always be centre stage. So here are some contemporary approaches to marketing that have evolved over the last few decades. Um, when I say contemporary, some of them are not particularly new, go back even in the 1980s, but they are a response to the overemphasis on just using the four Ps that was so dominant in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, etc. So what do these new approaches have in common? Well, they're not based on the four Ps. Um, and they're not related to what's known as the standard microeconomic paradigm um, that uh, marketing is simply about transactions, the buying and selling of goods, the exchange of products and services for money. So one strand of these new approaches of marketing is to recognise the importance of services in all organisations. And this is known as service dominant logic. Even organisations which are marketing tangible products like washing machines 
are often also marketing services. If you think about buying a new washing machine, you might um, also buy a guarantee, a, a repair plan, a financing plan. You might organise um, for the, the, the delivery and installation of the machine and the removal and uh, green environmentally friendly disposal of your existing washing machine, your old machine. Those are all services. So you're buying a bundle of services and a tangible product. And often it's the intangibles, the services, that are the things that will encourage the customer to buy with a particular retailer, a particular buyer, a particular brand. So service dominant logic recognises the importance of the intangible element in every single thing that we market, the importance of customer experience, the importance of the intangibles. A second strand to these newer contemporary approaches to marketing is relationship marketing, again moving away from the transactional. Now in the business to business world this is often referred to as network marketing. Relationship marketing and network marketing recognise that very few um, uh, purchases of products or services are purely transactional and that in most cases uh, there will be scope to build an ongoing relationship between the buyer and the seller to encourage them to purchase additional uh, products and services over time to encourage them to be a regular repeat buyer over time. And this makes sense for both customers and organisations. As a customer, you can get to know the organisation. It's easy for us. It's, it provides a, a more convenient way if we continue to use the same bank, use the same insurance company, etc. From an organisational point of view, it's also very convenient. Um, and very valuable because they can count on our loyalty, they can count on our business, they can count on that future stream of revenue. But loyal customers must be treated well. It's very frustrating to know that, for example, in with car insurance, only new customers get the best deals and discounts. And that if you are a loyal customer and just renew your policy year upon year, you might not be getting the best deal. So it's incumbent on us as marketeers to make sure that our existing customers are treated well, are treated fairly and get the best deals as well as the new customers. The um, network marketing concept uh, is important in business to business. And this recognises that in business to business marketing, organisations don't operate in isolation. They are completely dependent on being part of a network of interdependent organisations that help each other to do what they do. Um, suppliers of raw materials, suppliers of finance, suppliers of skilled labour, etc. So these networks operate to allow each network member to market its services and its products effectively. The next contemporary approach to marketing, and these are not mutually exclusive, by the way, they're all uh, interrelated and organisations can be engaging in more than one or indeed all of them at any point in time, is internal marketing. This is the recognition that everybody who works in an organisation is actually playing an important role in marketing, is playing an important role in uh, delivering value to the end customer. If you, Let's think about our hotel again. We've used Hyatt Hotels as an example. Let's stick with them for a few more minutes. So you check into a Hyatt Hotel in Paris. Think of all of the people who have worked to make your experience and who will work to make your experience a good one. The cleaners, the cooks, the people who have ordered up the food and the drinks that have make sure that the bar is stocked, um, the, uh, the fitness instructor in the gym who will give you some tips to make your workout more efficient, uh, the check-in, the people in the check-in desk who are friendly, who are polite, who are kind if you're late or if you've lost a bag or if you've had a terrible journey. Every single one of those people 
is important in delivering a high quality customer experience, delivering value to the customer. None of them have marketing in their job title. The marketing is almost too important to be left to just the people who've got marketing in their job title. And that can be very important for people in organisations, giving them pride in what they do, making them realise the importance of their role, whether it's cleaning an aeroplane, whether it's stocking a bar, whether it's making sure um, that computer software works efficiently all the time, that they play a key role in ultimately serving the customer. The next approach to marketing is known as postmodern and critical marketing. And I'm not going to say very much about this. You have, you can see on the slide there, there's a reference, a citation, SAR in 2010, and you can find plenty of other things to read. Um, but this takes a, a very um, quite extreme, quite radical view of, of marketing and its role in society and draws very heavily on postmodern philosophy as its underpinnings. And really, it's rather outside the scope of this short operational global marketing module. But if you want to know more about it, just ask at the next uh, class session. Finally, we mentioned co-creation already briefly when we talked about service dominant logic, customers co-creating. Um, and this is a, an increasingly recognised aspect of marketing, that customers and organisations co-create the value that the customer ultimately gets. Customers and organisations co-create brands. Um, co-creation uh, recognises the symbiotic relationship between the customer and the organisation that the customer is partly responsible for the value that they get, um, partly responsible for how they use the product, uh, what they do with it, what value they put it to, what, they, what use they make of it. And customers, through their interaction with brands, have their own personality on brands to an extent. Uh, we choose brands because of what we want people, what they want, what they say about us. Uh, and so we are co-creating that brand by choosing it, wearing it and using it. So the definition of marketing has changed a bit over the years. Um, the first definition on this screen there uh, from 1999 is a little bit different to the second one. And you should take a few minutes now to just pause uh, the video uh, read the definitions carefully and identify what you think are the main differences between the definitions. And then also, perhaps you'd like to think about whether you think any other changes are necessary, whether you feel that Doyle's 2004 definition is perfect these days. So read the two definitions, think about the differences between them, and think about whether you would make any further changes. And we can talk about that at our class session. So that concludes the first part of our very first session on BM7017 Global Marketing Management. Our discussion of and our thoughts about what is marketing today, what has it been and how it has changed. The remainder of this video concerns the global aspects of marketing. Global marketing management is simply marketing across a range of countries. And that's what most organisations do. There are very few organisations that really operate only in one country these days. Most organisations operate in a range of countries and some are almost entirely global. So there are some really big questions that marketing managers need to ask themselves when they are marketing across a range of countries. Which of the elements of operational marketing, which of our four Ps, our seven Ps, can stay the same? In other words, what can we standardise across groups of countries or maybe even across all countries? Can we standardise the brand name? Can we standardise the product itself? Its features, its function, its recipe? Can we standardise our packaging? Can we standardise the price? 
which elements of our operational marketing do we need to change? What do we need to adapt? And this standardization versus adaptation question is really the underlying theme of this whole module. How on earth do we decide what is the right approach to standardization versus adaptation? As we will see, standardization, the more we standardize, the more chance we have of saving money. Standardizing enables us to cut costs, to manufacture the same product everywhere, rather than having to change our recipe, our formulation, our design, the same packaging, the same advertising. But standardization can be problematic. And sometimes we need to adapt what we do to conform to local cultures, local environments, or to counter local uh, competition. Um, adaptation can enable us to be more responsive to local country markets, to overseas markets, but it's costly. So we need to get the balance right. How do we decide what to standardise and what to adapt? Well, one place we can start is with the customer. We can look at buyer behaviour. And one of the important themes in this module is the impact that culture has on buyer behaviour. This slide shows some photographs of celebrations. The three photos on the top line are birthday parties from different parts of the world. The three photos on the bottom part of the slide are weddings. And you can see there are huge differences. There are differences in how many people are present, in how the people are dressed, what the people are doing, what they're eating. And so you can see that culture impacts on our life and therefore ultimately on our buyer behaviour. So in preparing for all these different celebrations, in buying the clothing, the presents, the food, the other things, um, we're going to be differing as we move from country to country and culture to culture. So to help us understand what we need to adapt, we need to understand the impact that culture has on buyer behaviour. So here are some more examples of the impact that culture can have on buyer behaviour. Let's think about rice, top left of this slide. We have two images here. We have a Japanese housewife who's shopping for rice. She's an expert consumer. Japanese eat rice pretty much every day. There are different sorts of rice for different uses. Similarly in China, in Thailand and Myanmar, etc., where rice is dominant. People there know about rice. They're buying large quantities of very specific forms of rice for very specific uses. In the US, rice is not so commonly consumed on the whole. And so we have our minute ready to serve long grain white rice that's ready to go in the microwave. Individual servings, which could be microwaved um, in little individual pots. So huge difference there in the product formulation, in the packaging, in the pack size. And those differences are driven by culture. Below that, we have two kitchens. On the left, we have a European kitchen that could be from a middle class home in Germany or the Netherlands or Sweden, for example. We've got ovens, we've got three ovens. We've got a microwave oven, we've got a convection oven, we've got a steam oven. We've got a huge fridge freezer. We've got a dishwasher, we've got an electric hob, we've got lots of space, cupboards to store things. And so the people who live in this home may be doing their grocery shopping every week or maybe even every fortnight or sometimes maybe even just buying some things online every month. They've got space to store large quantities of food and keep it fresh in freezers and fridges. They've got complex gadgets and equipment to follow recipes. They've got a wine cooler. So their um, shopping list is going to be very, very different from the people who live in the kitchen on the right. A typical kitchen in a small house in, in an Asian country, Vietnam or Thailand or Myanmar. No fridge, no countertops really, um, no fancy ovens, no dishwasher, uh, simple equipment. People here will be shopping every day, possibly even sometimes more than once a day to buy the fresh food that they need uh, and, and preparing it immediately. So these differences, these cultural differences, 
filter through to differences in buyer behaviour, differences in the types of products that are bought, the, the pack sizes that are bought, um, and whether frozen or fresh or chilled or ambient food is required. On the bottom right of our slide, we've got school lunches. We've got school lunches from different parts of the world. And again, you can see the differences in what we eat and that falters through to what we buy, what we buy in supermarkets, what we buy in grocery stores. Are we buying prepared food, uh, cartons, little pots of ready puddings? Are we cooking from scratch all the time with raw ingredients and sending our children to school with lovely tiffin uh, boxes of freshly prepared food? So our culture affects what we eat and that affects what we buy. And the top right hand side of this slide showcases Red Bull and we've got two Red Bull cans and I wonder which one you are most familiar with when you go to a store and see Red Bull for sale. On the left hand side we've got the Red Bull that you would commonly buy here in the United Kingdom and in many European countries and indeed in Austria where the brand originates. It's a tall slim can, blue and silver, very angular dramatic design and it has the two bulls going head to head logo in the middle. But the dominant colours are blue and silver, um, energetic, dramatic uh, colours. On the right, we have the Red Bull can that is used in China. And you can see there are many differences. The pack of the can shape is different. Size is different. The colours are different. Red Bull decided that they needed to adapt the packaging to make the brand successful in China. The traditional Red Bull can was not considered to be particularly popular. Uh, it didn't go down very well. It, Chinese consumers did not respond positively to that can in product tests. Um, in China, colour is very important. Some colours are auspicious and others not. And the blue and the silver were not auspicious colours. And so the colour of the can was changed to gold. Gold and red are auspicious uh, colours in China, signifying wealth and success, and good fortune, and strength. And so um, the colours were changed on the can to showcase those more auspicious colours. Also, the tall, thin can did not go down well with Chinese people and the shorter, uh, dumpier, more powerful, more squat shape considered to be preferable. So here we've got lots of examples of how culture affects buyer behaviour and indeed how some brands are adapted to respond to these differences in culturally driven buyer behaviour. Here we have another example of how culture affects buyer behaviour, and this is showcasing yoghurt. So on the left, we have a typical example of how yoghurt might be used, used in, say, Turkey or uh, another, another country in the Middle East. Um, a, a ubiquitous product consumed every day, natural yoghurt, to which savoury uh, ingredients might be added, mint, olive oil, salt, garlic potentially, and used as a condiment, we have shown with, with uh, um, menemen, uh, Turkish eggs for breakfast, eggs with spicy tomato sauce. Um, other parts of the world use yoghurt as a, as a dessert, a sweet product, and you can see the difference as we move to the right hand side of the side uh, from different countries. Yogurt being sold in small individual pots with sweet flavours, pineapple, coconut, vanilla, guava, mango, different fruit flavours. Very, very different way of consuming yogurt, which is culturally driven. So culture affects buyer behaviour and we need to adapt our products sometimes, flavours, pack sizes, etc. to cope with differences in buyer behaviour. The Pringles. On the left hand side, we can see Asian Pringles with a meat flavour. On the right hand side, we can see North American Pringles with a very sweet flavour. Which would you like to eat? They're quite radically different, aren't they? And these are localised adaptations that tap into particular local consumer preferences, 
local tastes. And people in other parts of the world might find them quite um, abhorrent, might think, oh, yuck, I couldn't possibly eat a chocolate, white chocolate peppermint Pringle. Um, but in a local market, they're very successful. So again, here we have examples of adaptations that are made to make products more successful, to localise them, to tap into local cultural norms and taste preferences. Here's another example of how culture affects buyer behaviour. And here we're looking more at the advertising and promotion aspects. So on the left hand side, we can see the Ronald McDonald brand character as he's normally used, say, in the UK or in the USA. He's promoting family fun, He's jumping out of a box, he's juggling balls and he's a sales promotion tool that is all about bringing families into McDonald's. The fact that he's a clown signifies fun and games and joyfulness and that uh, fun aspect is used very, very strongly. On the right hand side, we can see Ronald McDonald looking much more serious and he is holding his hands in a, a praying uh, gesture. And Ronald McDonald's like this are used, for example, in Thailand, standing outside stores to welcome customers into the store. So here we have McDonald's tapping into local cultural norms and using Ronald McDonald, the brand character, to signify respect for the customer in, for example, a Thai uh, cultural tradition. So when we think about global marketing, we need to plan very carefully. We need to plan what we're going to standardise and what we're going to adapt. So let's just take a few minutes now to look at the contents of a marketing plan. Now, you are going to be writing an outline marketing plan later in the module. That one of your assessments is based on that very task. So it's a good idea to perhaps bookmark this particular slide so that you can come back to it later and look at the contents of the marketing plan. A marketing plan always starts with a market situation analysis. Sometimes this is called a marketing audit, and it's a taking stock of where we are now. And through this, we evaluate um, our strengths and our weaknesses, uh, how many sales we have of our brand in different countries around the world, who are our key competitors, what are the aspects of the marketing environment that are favourable or unfavourable to us? We'll look at the marketing environment in a bit more detail in a minute. So our marketing situation analysis, our marketing audit, enables us to take stock of our current situation. Where are we now? What's good? What's bad? What needs to be kept the same? What needs to be developed? What needs to be changed? On the basis of that situation analysis, we then move to the second part of the marketing plan, which is the setting of marketing objectives. Now, marketing objectives must be smart. Some of you will have come across that uh, nomenclature before, but if you haven't, take time to look it up. This is something we're going to discuss at the in-class session. What do we mean? by SMART in the context of marketing objectives. And to get ready for our next class session, think of some actual SMART marketing objectives that an organisation might set for itself. You choose an organisation that you're familiar with or a brand and think of some SMART marketing objectives. Once we've set our marketing objectives, we need to develop our marketing strategy. And you can think of this as the roadmap through which the objectives will be achieved. How are we going to achieve our objectives? How are we going to get competitive advantage? How are we going to position ourselves in the market so that we will be successful? So the marketing strategy deals with segmentation, targeting and positioning. How is the market segmented? Who are the different types of customers? What uh, brands are they buying at the moment? 
what is our competitive position within each of those market segments? Which segments do we want to target moving forward? Who are our target customers going to be? And how do we want those customers to think of our product, our service, our brand? How are we going to position ourselves in their mind so that we stand out from the competition, so that our value and our offering to the customer is clear? So that is the marketing strategy part of our marketing plan. Segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Then we've got the marketing action plan, and this is our four P seven P's. These are the specific details, tactical details of the operational marketing elements that we are going to use day in, day out, week in, week out to bring our, plan, our marketing plan to life. What products are we going to have? What flavors, what pack sizes? Uh, what brand names are going to be used on each product? What prices are going to be charged? What distribution channels are we going to use? And what elements of marketing communications will be used to promote those products and services to the customers? And usually the marketing communications area has a marketing plan all of its own, the integrated marketing communications plan. And as I said earlier, marketing communications does not form part of this module. So we won't be talking about it in much more detail here, but you do have an entire separate module all about marketing communications, marketing communications planning. The final element of a marketing plan is evaluation and control procedures. And these are procedures and protocols that we will put in place to check whether the plan is working. So it may be market research that we conduct every six months um, to check whether our uh, customer satisfaction rates are as we want them to be, be analysing sales data, analysing customer feedback, a whole range of different uh, procedures that we will use in order to check whether the plan is on track. And the control procedures will be procedures that we will have ready in case things are not working, in case sales are not what we would expect them to be in case customer feedback is, is not positive in some aspect, what are we going to do about it? So we have to have these control procedures ready to implement in case the plan is not on track as we would require it to be. So the marketing plan starts with the situation analysis or the marketing audit. And that's where we take stock of what's going on in the world around us. And this slide shows the elements of the marketing environment. Now you can think of the marketing environment as the ocean and the marketeers, the marketing managers as being in the ship. The ship cannot control the ocean. We simply have to be aware of the ocean and its forces and to and navigate the most successful course through and across the ocean. That's what the marketing environment is, largely uncontrollable factors that we need to be aware of and understand and able to respond to and react to. So we think of the marketing environment as, as being roughly broadly divided into three sections. The external or the macro environment, which covers things like demographic forces, socioeconomic forces, cultural trends, the physical environment, the availability of land, raw materials, the political environment and the associated legal infrastructure, uh, which governs what organisations can and cannot do, and the technological environment that provides the technological platforms under which um, products can be developed and, and distributed and so on. And then we have the micro environment, the competitors, the all important competitors that we need to know and understand and be able to respond to and react to. Customers themselves, critically important understanding their buyer behaviour. Intermediaries, the organisations that we are dependent on when we are marketing, retailers, wholesalers, agents, brokers, that help us to reach our end customers. Publics, uh, organisations like the media, 
um, like trade unions, uh, pressure groups, lobbying groups who have an interest in what we do and who can influence public opinion, hopefully in a positive way, where we need to be aware of these publics and work with them and hopefully get them on our side so that they are presenting a positive view of us to the world. And suppliers, critically important suppliers of raw materials, finance, human resources, etc., without whom organisations would not be able to operate. And then right at the heart of this uh, marketing environment is the company itself. And we do have to take this into consideration because sometimes organisations themselves can be their own worst enemies. They themselves make it hard for them to achieve their objectives because they've set up a complicated structure. They don't have a, a, a big enough vision of what they can be and they don't have the right resources and competences. So we, uh, looking at the company, the organisation itself is a critically important part of the situation analysis and the marketing audit. What's good, what's bad, what is helpful and what is unhelpful in achieving objectives. When we are doing our marketing globally, we need to think about how many marketing plans do we need to have? Should we have one for every single country that we operate in? Um, or could we perhaps group countries together into regions? Uh, having one marketing plan for every country is going to be terribly time consuming. That's a lot of marketing plans to write. And they might have a great deal of similarity because consumer behaviour across countries might be very similar. And indeed, we might be able to group countries into regions where consumer behaviour is pretty much identical. So we could have a regional approach potentially to our marketing planning. Maybe we need to organise our marketing planning around specific product markets. If we think about cars, maybe we have a global marketing plan for SUVs, a global marketing plan for small electric cars. Maybe we are in a marketplace where buyer behaviour is essentially the same everywhere and we can have a standardised marketing plan for the whole world. That is not uncommon in business to business marketing. Um, for example, if you're an organisation that manufactures specialist surgical equipment for ophthalmic surgery, eye surgery, it doesn't really matter where in the world your surgeons are. Their requirements are going to be the same. A French ophthalmic surgeon, a Vietnamese ophthalmic surgeon, a Brazilian ophthalmic surgeon, their buyer behaviour in terms of the, the equipment they need and how they use it is going to be the same. And so organisations that operate in, in business to business can very often have standardised marketing plans for the whole world. So how many marketing plans you need depends on how similar or different your buyer behaviour is across countries. The more homogeneous the buyer behaviour is, the more similar it is everywhere, the more likely you are to be able to just have a single standardised global marketing plan. The more heterogeneous the buyer behaviour, the more differences there are in how consumers uh, operate country by country, the more likely you are to have to have separate marketing plans or at least separate adapted sections of your marketing plan. Another thing that you need to think about in marketing is who is actually going to be responsible for writing the marketing plan. Essentially, there are two approaches. You can go top down or bottom up. Top down marketing planning means that the marketing plan is written at company headquarters and then it is handed out to local country uh, operating divisions, possibly with allowance being made for some level of adaptation, maybe not. And that top down approach facilitates standardisation consistency and also it makes it easier for organisations to monitor performance. These all important evaluation and control procedures are easier with top-down planning. Everybody uh, has a very clear view of, of what they have to do. The plan is written centrally and then disseminated out across the company. Bottom-up planning 
um, can be a bit more messy, can be a bit more complicated, but the big advantage is it's certainly more responsive to local market needs. People who work in the local country operating division know their customers locally. They know the competition. They know the local marketing environment. They know what's likely to work best. And so they're best placed to suggest adaptations. Now, of course, you can iterate between the two, and that's what many organisations do. They start with a top down planning shell and then allow local operators, local marketing people to make some adaptations. And the word global has grown up as a sort of hybrid of the global and the local. Standardise what is possible to standardise to keep costs under control, as long as it doesn't impact on the value that is delivered to the consumer, and adapt what you need to adapt to make the product locally perfect, to make it really deliver excellent optimal value to local customers. This is a very complicated diagram, and I don't expect you to take it all now, in now, but please bookmark it maybe even save the diagram and keep it close by. And as we go through this module, we will refer to this um, evolution, uh, evolutionary approach to global marketing. And basically the diagram charts the course of an organization in its approach as it moves from being a single country, domestic only organization through to a fully global organisation. Its whole view, its orientation, its structure and its approach to marketing changes. So please keep this diagram close and we will return to it as we move through the rest of the module.